All right. So, hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for attending uh, this afternoon's event, See Yourself Sensing with Madeline Schwartzman. My name is James Laux. I'm an assistant professor uh, at Chatham University here in Pittsburgh, and it's a pleasure to be convening this event. Before we get to that, I have a couple of quick housekeeping items. So, uh, one, I want to let everybody know that uh, this is being recorded, this lecture, and two, I want to uh, let everybody know that we are using the Q&A tool for this uh, event. Um, the audience, you're welcome to type in any questions into the q and I'll be taking a look at those. And if time permits, we will try to get to those. Um, please understand that we won't be able to answer all questions, but we will do our very best, okay? So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce Madeline Schwartzman, um, our speaker uh, this afternoon. Uh, Schwartzman is a New York City-based writer, filmmaker, architect, and architect whose work explores human narratives and the human sensorium through social art, curating, experimental video making, and book writing. Right here, she's holding, you can see Madeline's holding up uh, a couple of, uh, or one of her books, See Yourself Sensing, Redefining Human Perception, See Yourself X, Human Futures Expanded. Schwartzman is a long-term faculty member at Barnard College, Columbia University, and Parsons, the new school of design, or for design, excuse me. Um, one last thing in talking with Madeline and thinking about her studio practice, I feel that the work is extremely timely and the issues raised are pertinent uh, to our current moment. Um, one thing that I think is that our practice doesn't need to exist only in white cube or in sort of these very privileged settings. Uh, it can be an active participant and meaningful point of departure across disciplines and you know, uh, culture, uh, social location uh, to instigate these important conversations about our society and be an instrument to push things forward. And I think Madeline's work accomplishes exactly that. So with that, Madeline, I'm going to turn the screen over to you and yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. And a shout out to my students at Parsons and Barnard in Columbia. I know a sprinkling of you are here and hi to everybody. And thank you for inviting me. This Sculpture X seems fantastic. I want to thank Lisa Austin and um, James for introducing me and Lisa for inviting me. I'm about to show you what tends to overwhelm people like at least 200 maybe 250 slides and videos and it, there's never enough time so first I'm warning you that at some point I will just go crazy or skip something the second thing is that my introduction to my talk is about 45 slides and videos which is about the amount that a normal person would show in their talk but I feel obliged as I screen share um, to to do it that way. Now I'm gonna to try to share audio, it may not work. We forgot to test that. Let's see if I can get this going. Looks pretty good. Okay, we are up. The other thing I'll tell you is that I never really do a talk twice. I move it around depending on um, to whom I'm speaking. So today I bumped up my students' work to the top and I'm going to student work and explain something really, oh, my internet connection is unstable. That's scary because I'm in New York City. Um, I'm going to try to take you through how my work was influenced by student work. My books are a result of the work I do with my students. And so there's this incredible mixture of how, um, how and why I think of things I do. So we'll, we'll get to all that. First, the 40 or 45 slide introduction so you know what I'm talking about. Um, this is the cover of my two books, See Yourself Sensing was published in 2011, almost 10 years ago. And See Yourself X um, was late in getting published. It should have been published like five years ago, but maybe it was around two. And there's a new book coming. So, so one thing that I might be most known for is these books. Although, um, and yeah, I like to play around with my images. So uh, these are animations of how I see these books. That is actually the, the video of the cover piece an artist named Hung Koo Lee mm. from Korea who wanted to augment certain physical features to transform himself. I found that very inspiring. Um, a complete non sequitur 
in the COVID time, we have to make do with what we have on hand. So if you like this man, Hans Langseth, he is the world's longest beard owner. They are playing jump rope with his beard while he is wearing his beard. And I feel like um, it's a really joyous picture. Nobody seems to really care that this artifact is like this semi-living thing. And later you'll find out that it is stored at the Smithsonian Institution. So some of the work, I, I don't really think I'll give you, I'll give you an overall trigger alert, which is that there are some weird things in this talk that sometimes you want to look away and maybe it makes you uncomfortable to see this long beard, but it's not that much more weird than what we already have. And the idea of transforming something to play and sharing it seems so neat. And then the story of how it was found. So in the introduction, I explain that a lot of what I do is take a profession like architecture, which I happen to go to graduate school for. And that's where I met Lisa Austin, one of the people running this Sculpture X. She was fabulous person in graduate school and still. And um, I, I started to wonder like, why do we have this thing where we are disconnected from architecture? So I will do little sketches to say, well, could a human and architecture be linked? And then I'll find that this guy, William Cobbing, has found this sort of umbilical-like thing that you would connect to. And then, then you get time to think about what, what is the building monitoring when it touches, I think, this woman's belly? And is it somehow, um, is there procreation involved? So I love things that stop the boundaries of professions like the ones that you're studying and mess with them. This is the introduction to my art and technology. Uh, an important piece I did two years ago in Thailand that started what is called Face Nature, my current art practice. And I'll show you a little more about that. Um, this is to introduce that part of my work is studying the human body and um, this is a Jan Fabre image. I can't see my presenter notes, so I will sound um, like I don't know what I'm talking about every once in a while when I don't remember a name, but I, this time I remembered Jan Fabre. So I've co-opted this image as the image that I think I'm doing when I look at the human body. We don't understand consciousness, so we're constantly digging away to understand things. I use this image to explain a monstrosity that um, we should be careful when we think of creatures and things other than us as monsters because we are monsters. Our baby teeth, if you look at them in a section cut through the jaw, are monstrous two sets of teeth. Like that seems creepy. And then this image, um, a representation of the human nose with a little teeny person that I would call like a homunculus. Uh, someone steering your ship. Who's steering your ship? Are you or is your brain? Um, is another kind of monstrosity that maybe it's the bacteria in your body. So these are things that I'm introducing as things I think about. I think about this moment. I can't see any of you. I can't feel any of you. I don't even know how many of you are there. I hope you're there. But I hope this is what we're doing later, especially when you're shooting back a question or in your design studio, you're one big thought bubble. Other things that I introduced to you is like that um, research, that, that really keeping up with science is super important. So the New York Times has decent science articles. I get a subscription to um, Scientific American and a few other journals. I don't seem to find much time to read them, but when I do, I'm like sucking them up. And this is an example. This is an article about how you have smell reception other places than your nose. Like if you get that your nose smells, but you don't understand what it means when your skin smells. When your skin is smelling, it means that I, I can smell my screen now. And that messes with your sense of what, what the senses are. So a lot of this talk is to try to dematerialize what you think are the boundaries of the human sensorium. I'm also introducing to you that when I see an article like that, I try to make it my own through a very silly sketch of someone with noses everywhere. And that will lead me to someone's work in my book, um, Lawrence Malstoff, who does this very well-known piece now on the internet called Shrink, where he shrink wraps himself. He did it at my book launch. And when you shrink wrap yourself, you are in what he says is like a hug. 
what we think looks scary, but that idea that um, your environment now is so teeny that it's dis disabling the smell sensors in your arm is how I like to think about things. So this is the book launch of my first book, See Yourself Sensing. And Lawrence Malstoff is there. He's using my vacuum cleaner to suck out the air and everyone thinks he's gonna die. But this is what it really looks like. So we're still in the introduction. Another thing I'm always looking at is the human brain. And for my second book, like what happens? How do we expand ourselves in space? And is it, is it our brain ultimately that's gonna go off from us? Some people speculate in the post-human scenario that there won't be a, a we, they'll just be um, biological packages like Lorenzo Ogiano down below, who is representing their a new form of being where there are no humans, there's just biology and sort of machine. Uh, more of a little teeny segue into my experiments with like hands and bodies of different kinds. So this is when I took a class on Arduino and I cast fingers um, and began to have like a third hand, which really does feel weirdly comforting. You know, the third hand is a project where you put one hand behind your back and then you put a rubber hand on the table. And over time, if somebody prods that hand that's in your view, you'll feel the pain. So third hands are, are an ongoing interest. Along with this kind of work are weird things done in nature. So here I am doing a project with a guy named Andy Quitmeyer, who now is based in Panama and has a lab there. And I'm casting um, these wonderful pieces of fungi with silicone in order to, and there's me casting a giant leaf and there's my casting factory and that's me making a, a resin leaf, hundreds and hundreds of them. Again, in the introduction to what I do. And this is Andy's in my installation that showed at a show I curated in New York City. On two giant dry cleaners. So keep active. If you go to the dry cleaner, you can get really excited about those, what I call uppy downies. You know, your clothing goes down and up, and then say, huh, I'd like to put that in my work. How do I find a dry cleaner? I can tell you how. And also, in my introduction, is there's a world of images out there. There's almost, almost too many images. And when you look around, you might find something you like super much. And these works are actually experiments. Um, Lee Griggs experiments with CGI. He's not really doing it because they're necessarily researched to be the future of humans. But for me, they spark notions of the future of humans. And then finally, the see yourself sensing student work that I'm about to show you, ganged here together. Years, um, I'm still doing it really, but, and I, is a giant archive of them and maybe I'll make them a book, but these are like really beginning students and I throw at them a sense-based project and they come out with spectacular things. Most of these are from Barnard and Columbia in particular where I was able to exercise that. So for example, this is a fantastic student who made this device that has pins inside and is alternately and inversely you can see or have tingles. So suddenly you see differently and sense differently. And then for you all out there, like what are you given genetically? Like genetically, um, this wonderful student just could build models in 100th the time that I could and was able to make things that were so spectacular. It stopped, I stopped caring what they were doing and just enjoyed them. So I'm almost done with the introduction. I like and am really working possibly on the next um, big work of mine about cross-species meeting and hybridity. And that's like a human plus a pangolin. A pangolin now is much more well-known since the pandemic than before, but is a creature that I really love. This was a birthday present from my collaborator, Andy Quitmeyer, um, turning me into a pangolin. So 
a human plus something else really interests me. Then I do research and I find out that in Zimbabwe, the pangolin keepers who are protectors of this spectacular animal then will actually wrap them around their head and it will look very much like this Atelier XJC project in See Yourself Sensing that is really a beautiful design object. So what a spectacular, and we use big words like spectacular a lot, but I, I look at this with so much excitement. How can we respect all these creatures? It's, um, just as a segue, I was driving along a road today and passed, I would say like 50 dead animals. And, and I thought to myself, oh, another dead animal, another dead animal. And then I thought, this is a dead animal. It's so frustrating to me that the way that we build roads in this country just take away habitat and there's no crossing. Like every road should have in its budget, even though it costs a fortune, some kind of passageway. And the final image is a fashionable image with like a hear no evil or see no evil. But my idea is that you may have to live with some kind of primate, uh, another kind of primate on your body to survive in the future. Back to pangolins, still in the introduction, what are new spectacular sites and things we could look at? So the pangolin tongue, once you start looking at them, is super spectacular. There's a section cut of a pangolin. It goes down to the bottom of their rib cage. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how long that would be. You look for yourself and think about like extending your tongue two feet from where you are now, picking up your car keys. Why do I think about that? Because I don't like to think that humans are special and spectacular. We might engineer a longer tongue. There's a cringe image. I'm gonna back up and say trigger alert. A lot of people find this image by um, the artist whose name now, I mean, it, this one's gonna escape me for a minute. On the left, she's licking, her husband's licking her eyeball. On the right is a joke by an Italian artist parodying that. And I think just overall, it's a hilarious thing about new sites of sensation, about taboo. I have tried this before. I, I'm not sure I would do it in the pandemic or ever again, but I will continue. So we can have new relationships with these newfound sites, um, touching our very sensitive eyelashes, or by this artist Kang Xin in China, who actually, if we think it's gross to touch things or lick things, but everywhere he goes, he licks things. So if he goes to the US or in a piece of masonry or a piece of money, and that's a kind of taboo. We don't wanna really think about our tongue doing that. Another taboo is like, we always wanna have a bad guy we have some really bad guys right now in the world, but in terms of like monsters, this is not a real monster. This is a manga called Uzumaki and the monster is the vortex. So the vortex makes people in the town grow long hair, four stories high. So it, it, that makes me think um, a little bit outside of the box about storytelling that you don't need a person as a protagonist you can or the bad guy and that the forces of nature can be daunting as we see with climate change um in the introduction i want you to note that that big green ball is the biomass of the earth's plants um, we have terrible cutting of the forests in south america and if you look now that little dot there is the biomass of humans in comparison. How could we not be super careful about our plant world with this in notion, the respect that our planet's biomass is so much bigger? No, we want to do this to our country, to Alaska. We want to take away that biomass. It's the most terrible idea for the sustainment of our planet. And I, I urge you all, when you're not, this is not like a turn you off on my politics. This is more like what my talk is about. It is really about a little bit of a gentle wake up and you'll see that in face nature. So how do I wake up? Well, I'm volunteering with my daughters at a botanical garden and 
Um, so I'll take their leftover plants that are on the garbage heap. In this case, it's the wedding bouquet of a dear friend of mine's daughter. And I'll start some kind of dissection. And you know, this is a kind of respect, like what is that weird yellow thing? To take it apart is to analyze it, to count the number of pieces, to look at their curve, to know that they're full of pollen and they're making me sick. Or, so not really, I didn't get as hit with that. Um, this is a thistle. I got really excited about the thistle in Brooklyn in a park. And so I started like dissecting it and looking at it. Now, I won't presume for you to, I want you to know that when I look at something, I don't think, oh, I know what I'm doing, it's gonna be great. Largely, I look at something and I say, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if I can do anything with this. So I collected all this thistle and I thought, what do I do with this? And I was like, I'm washed up, I have nothing to say. And then I stuck it in my hair and that was when I got excited, right? The thistle was jiving with my hair so beautifully. So in the introduction, to show you how I work and think, then I started a set of works with thistle. So those are like, a little advanced here is connecting the thistle to a grill, connecting the thistle to a kind of puppetry. Um, and speaking of what James said, none of this is highbrow. This is taking place in my bathroom. And this is another bathroom and getting really advanced with the thistle. Like if I don't cut the stems and looking kind of hideous late at night in bad lighting. And then almost finally in the introduction is like, okay, then collecting a lot in the woods. Maybe that means I'm taking the biomass, but, um, and making these suits out of them that have this incredible transformation in how I move and even how I think and feel. So, uh, oh, I'm still at the introduction. So my body of work that I have up in exhibition now is called Face Nature. And it's pretty obvious it's putting nature on my face. More subtly, it's very accessible. People know they have a face. People recognize I have a face. People recognize that's nature and it's gone. And there begins to be a little bell that goes off about hierarchy and intimacy of plant life. Uh, a person that just wrote about my exhibition, David Hayes, wrote about how my work breaks the distance of how traditionally we see landscape. Traditionally, we're distant from the landscape. It's over there, look at it. But I'm putting it so close that it, I'm feeling it and smelling it and I'm becoming it. And finally, in, in the face nature is my branching to hegitecture. Hegitecture is in COVID, I hope this is a video, is me sort of pretending I'm at a bush in San Francisco that I've never been to and coming in and out of it. So now we start with the student work. This is um, a body of work called See Yourself Sensing. It predates the book. It started in the early 2000s. And um, the title is very similar to an Olafur Eliasson piece because I went to the Museum of Modern Art and saw that piece. And then I never found the piece because it was sort of hidden but I like the title and I transformed it a little. Your titles are not copyrighted. The course I was teaching had turned into um, having the word perception in it. And so I thought my architecture students should know what it means to perceive. So these are all the um, Jean, a wonderful model maker. Hope you can see this. My connection is unstable right now. There you go. Keep That's going. Cassie Keep with going. her um, first time she's ever built something in units, just like robot makers do. She's incredibly talented naturally at construction, extending her tongue, and all the others having what the one on the bottom left is about breath. Um, again, at Barnard and Columbia, all different senses. The one on the upper right, I think I have a video of, video of and that is... Um, a student who went and bought all kinds of chemicals. And this one has to do with almost like a periscope-like vision, except that without my teaching it, went and got motored. It's the orientation of the mirrors. Now the wonderful thing about this student um, is that he now is, has his own firm. It's like 15 years later. I think it's called 
gray area, now I'm confused. That's one of those things that I can't see in my presenter notes. Um, and if anyone wants to, I will answer these in the questions or later. And he uses his giant robot arm, like his little robot arm, to manipulate materials in innovative ways. So when I, my students have to look at, um, think deeply about, let's say, a snail. So if they're doing a perceptual project, maybe they'll look in the center at Dr. Doolittle, the original, what I grew up with. And, and it's really important that you notice that the snail on the left has no eyes, of course, because the eyes are at the end of their horns. And the snail in the middle has been faked to have eyes. So we often fake work to suit human consumption. A student of mine will then do documentation of that, saying, well, what if we did what a snail has? And then come up with a fun project. I think I have a video of that. So these are more than one connection, perhaps here in sight, taking your sonic quality around. Mostly they're the first time I've ever built anything. And I'm gonna show a number of these. In this case, it's a kind of inverse relationship to sight and smell. And they're using laminate structure. This is uh, my student who went to got like chemicals to look at after image and after taste. So you can actually sense your breath through the visual of the chemical as well as your after image through the light. They're crude devices, but they work. And these are two alternate ways to kind of access the senses. One is kind of incredible because the mouth is then you realize like, oh, the mouth is like a little monster. These are about sequencing the senses with Lego mode. Yeah. Should I unpause them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Press the gray again. Press the orange one because these won't go down otherwise. Oh, okay, ow. <laughs> <laughs> have not that intention and here's the set for the piece Aaron on the bottom right came all through the I and B. Those two subjectivity have to make different places. So in my class, we'll do a lot of material experiments with either basswood or chipboard, and that is actually for an architectural studio, those head pieces. No, I'm waiting. And then we will make um, action with mobile with superstructures, and we'll wear these mobile pieces and see how body diagonality affects the that was from last year. We'll make machines that move our wearables through our body motion. Like we, we know the elbow and the shoulder and hand are connected, but when you see the interim, you feel something different. This is Louisa, my book assistant for See Yourself X, the first and last student so far in decades to do a project about nursing or breastfeeding. And then I'll do projects like, okay, let's analyze a book and do a book performance. So I'm kind of directing my students last year in a book performance. So suddenly a, a book is no longer dismissed as just for reading, but also for interaction. And that's because I was assigning a literacy project on the subway, which looks like this. So first they were uh, dematerializing books into constructions that two people could manipulate. And then they were on the way to the critique on the subway when, when we were all pre-masked, pre-COVID. So they're elaborate constructions in this studio, not the one where they make 
headpieces, but a different one, whose titles have now changed. So the critique is on the subway, and this is one student named Maddie's work where the guest critics are sitting in this kind of new literacy station that contains the books and brings, why shouldn't we have more kind of activities on the subway that help people? And you can read these books at the end here. And then when you're done, or I have to That's lose the subway, I can roll this back in and I can move. <laughs> Thank so you. How new forms bring new methods of seeing things. So she becomes a readable book for multiple people at different heights. Very awkward to have a critique on the subway. This is Christian. He's from Germany. He makes made an incredible piece. planned in advance the linkage of your laptops. Can you see a theme? Like normally your laptop is individual. How can we use them as a collective? This is, I, you know, my peculiar mind. Um, this is Vanessa in my class. One week into class, she came with this. These are field stations for measuring a site. And she already had mount, shoulder mounted thing that kind of highlights your level of anxiety as you go through the site. So it's wonderful to see what students can do so quickly. Well, I can't take questions now, so I'm shooting right into face nature. Um, that starts with the wonderful Dynacon conference that took place for the first time in Thailand. And it was a place where people came from all over the world to an island to make art. I came with, um, I came with, what are they called, alligator clips. I knew I wanted to attach nature to alligator clips and put them on my face. The conference was amazing because there was like a marvelous ship that we could ride on or sleep on. And, and it was overwhelming. The first day I got there, you know, exhausted from the trip and we get on the boat and I'm like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to go into the hull and do work. So this is the workstation and this is what it looked like. a person named Michael Candy in there who's got his Dremel. So I start drilling my chopsticks, not having intended to. And all of a sudden I make this modular piece with no glue with these clips. And Michael Candy is a robot maker and artist who's so clever. And he helped me to um, use his portable homemade 3D printer and print servo motor holders that would allow these things to move uncannily. And you'll see a little video of this. Here's what he, the blue part is what he cast. And this is our study of the motion. And people were real generous. So some other people helped cast the battery. like my Arduino skills from that class, sort of on steroids. I got a lot of help from nice people. And then eventually I put on the garbage that had surrounded the site. The island, magnificent, but full of plastic garbage. And I walk off to the distance. I'll stop there. So, 
I segue now to finding things like walking around and being cognizant of nature and leaves. And then my studies with my students, like how can you get away from boring materials in the studio that have been taught since the Bauhaus and maybe use cabbage leaves. My, my students are so wonderful. If I don't name you, I thank you for all the great work you've done. Here's me serve a pine cone. And then in Fort Greene years ago, fall two years ago, just doing this, my connection is unstable momentarily. And then starting this practice. And how the practice works is I forage for nature. So this is in Eindhoven. I'm going to speak at Balton Labs and do a workshop. I'll order the nature in my hotel room on the floor. And those are a lot more leaves than it looks like. I'll use the bathroom sink as some kind of studio. And at two in the morning before I teach, I'll do these kinds of things. So face nature began a lot on my hands and face. So in the fall, you'll see the seasonal content. And this is a little reel that is now in an exhibition. So I'll forage, I'll study, I'll look at the morphology of the body and how the morphology of the body and piece of nature work in concert with each other so that a human can become something different and nature becomes something different. And then I'll conclude it's maybe like a disaster or sort of super successful. So this is my recent array on my Google Drive for the exhibition. A shout out to Space P11, where my work is in Chicago on exhibit. If anyone wants to go, there's an opening tomorrow, Friday, from 10 to two, from 12 to 2. And these guys were really uh, wonderful to put up my work. So this is an example of face nature. My face is almost typing in one and in the other, it's like you suddenly see the awkward, strange rotational movements I make. And this is actually really during COVID. There was a storm recently, so I collected all of the incredible lichens that fell and I dismantled a pine cone. And then I, in one, I naturally felt like a bird. And in the other, I felt like some ancient creature, like, or like as someone said, as David Hayes said, a, a Cindy Sherman. So we're almost through. This is the face nature reel. A few I'll show you. This is me with cabbage. I purchased that cabbage, ornamental cabbage. All kinds of found fall leaves. Glimmers and glimpses of the human face. Strange mobile portraits. Strange sense-based things. Some more ornamental. I'm gonna, for in the interest of time so that I get through everything. Um, this is what face nature looks like when I'm making it. And very often these pictures are very vulnerable because I'm discomforted. The glue is falling off, something's going wrong and I'm not taking them to be glamorous, they're frightening. And that's the final piece of that one you saw. And I use um, oak pieces and burrs and with the oak, of course, I feel suddenly gritted and measurable. Halloween, I made this. Different places where I've been stationed. On the right is Florida, where I took my kids once. In the night, I'm working with the sea grapes. Um, also to tell you that I do stuff with my students as a transition where Let's say we do a whole kind of exercise with gloves and then we begin to make them inhabitable. So, or when I'm at um, a school like in Michigan at Cranbrook, I'll do my own piece so that people will see that I'm not afraid to work with students while they're working. So they were doing face nature and I was doing this in November. 
Um, we're about to move to my books, but before we do, so wherever I go, I like to go to botanical gardens. And in this case, I was lucky enough to be in Madrid and my friends there photograph me as part of the botanical gardens. And what I'll do is I'll be invited to give face nature workshops. So it'll be similar. We'll go foraging. And this is in Barcelona. Um, and we will find nature and begin to make structures for it after analyzing it. So this fellow is using a counterweight to hold these found fragrant pieces on his face. To me, it's important that they're not masks. They're not on the face. There's a distance between them and then they become more interesting because of it. And that's because I teach architectural design. I love this. Unfortunately, he didn't have time to put all the moss on, but you see that there's this moss receptacle. And in, in the interest of time, usually I have one or two days to do this with students. So here I just was having to get to the airport. So I'm like, let's tie it on him. And we did that. This is in Madrid. These are high school students at the American School in Madrid. A day a workshop of face nature. They were fabulous and they loved looking into nature. This is somebody in Eindhoven in my workshop at Balkan Labs. A, a woman who works as an administrator and never made anything is suddenly like super creative. We can all still be into Arduino. A student at Cranbrook in the 4D design program where I gave a Face Nature workshop. This is Michael Candy working with another student. She's a jewelry designer and made a silver mount for the punk. Uh -huh. This is the dramatic part of this piece of nature that I have brought to class. Oh, oh, oh. And this is what it looks like now. It looks simple how it's moving, but what a beautiful little design this is, how one piece rotates around the other. I, I wish I were like Michael with this ability to brainstorm in robotics. I mean, you're like born that way. And then I went to um, the California College of Art and a colleague worked with... Um, you know, what's this called again? Um, light <laughs> mapping. So we can use light in interesting ways. Okay, it's almost segueing through, let's see how we're doing. Um, 3.45, so this is a picture of a culvert blocked for beavers. So this goes back into that thing, like we are obsessed in America with blocking the beavers from making these incredible things they make, blocking off the water. So we can get this literature, how to keep beavers from plugging culverts. When, you know, when the people came to the United States, it's like it was all, all giant beaver dams. I mean, this is their property too. So that made me think about this kind of image, like nature takes over our world. I hear that an iPhone can be taken over by nature real fast. So ultimately though, we're doing all these things, we find that we can have a tree eat a bench. Who's really in charge? We, we see nature being in charge right now. Um, nature can consume a bus, but um, the architect that did the Whitney, uh, I have a mental block with one or two or three people and I always do with him, it will come to me, I love his work. He takes a bus and puts it in the architecture. Nature takes the bus and goes over it. And then, you know, a traveler takes a car and puts it inside of another traveling thing. And now a trigger, trigger alert for a scary image coming up. How do we, we house animals weirdly in cars to move them along, but then also we could be out on a motorcycle ride and hit a deer. So I'm looking at the collisions. It's a scary image, the deer survived and so did the human. I'll go past that. What is this collision and what do we do about it? So I started to look at nature and how our garbages are sort of hidden in nature and that led to this kind of exercise called hedgetecture. It's me trying to actually make architecture and inhabitation of some of the beautiful things I see. So I'm taking a nap in a bush outside my apartment and I'm constantly experimenting with coming out of and thinking, well, but why do we always hide the garbage in the hedge? We could hang out in the hedge. 
I'm not the only one that thinks this way. So this is Switzerland, a super rule abiding Zurich. And I crawl into the hedge. This is what it looks like inside. And then I pop out while somebody's videotaping me. And it's very hilarious, right? At this intersection. So things can happen and nobody really notices with hedges. So I turned this, found this image of a hedge as a home. And I started to draw people into these giant hedges. And that led me to this pandemic exercise in making myself come out of hedges I've never been to. So I'm gonna play this for you. I'm a film and video maker, aside from all this. So don't let the pandemic limit you. Use your kind of technological skills to do some weird stuff. We started as little exercising. That's the elephant I think. This is, um, what's his name? Andy Goldsworthy, walking on a bush when I said other people do this. I'm jumping to the books and I'm gonna go real fast. So the thing you should know is people look at books and they're intimidated. I could never make a book. And I was not really equipped to make a book, but I had this great student work and I went to the Dean of Columbia and I said, what do you think about this student work as a book? And he said, don't put student work in it. Find work like this that others have done. The internet was young. Every day, me and a couple of assistants would find like one image. And now you can find thousands. And that's how this book came about. I collected more professional work. And guess what? Whenever I show the work, everyone wants to see the student work. So here are the books. This is See Yourself Sensing, the five chapters, logical chapters, weird chapters, future chapters. And it contains things like this. So on the upper left is a sculpture. Uh, called Monocle by Jaime Pitar. The middle is a pepper mill that sneezes. The right is a prosthetic nose if you had syphilis. Um, in, back in the day, you, your nose would cave in. Stellark on the bottom left in the middle, the nasal ranger and Stellark on the right with his third arm. The nasal ranger is a purchasable product if you live near a garbage dump. And more images of um, your sensation being kind of changed and spectacular, like on the bottom left, Daito Manabe, normally you don't have lights in your mouth. On the right, um, Kyang Peng Ong with a mask where it would show you if you were in a flood zone and various other works. Anne Hamilton, with whom I went to graduate school, as well as with Lisa, with toothpicks on her coat. Um, projects that are more environmental, like the bottom one that is very dark, it's, um, and genius. It's about providing a habitat for someone who's stealing away, trying to leave one country by going into the airplane wing so that at least they would survive. So I like projects that are sort of politically incorrect and correct. This is a walking camera obscura by Alphonse Schilling. And this is an artist who, where she wore this piece in different countries, people would react. Sometimes it would be seen as a party. Sometimes they would be called communists. So art, art is perceived differently in different places. Um, beautiful works by all these people. If you're interested, this is all in See Yourself Sensing and it's still available. Ways of Changing Your Gender by our, a Japanese artist, Kriku. And this is another one of these political works. It's called Delusions of Self-Immolation, where you can actually go into a gallery and in the 90s at least, when we could use fire, strangely, um, gel up, self-immolate for half a second and be put out by, uh, by water. Now, you might think this is sick, but I think it's a representation of what is happening around the world that we like to hide. It happens in Afghanistan when young women are forced to marry. When I was a child, it happened in China as protest. So 
how do we look at these things? How do we look at people's responses to our art, like Marcel Lee Antunes Roca on the left, where people can actually pull his face, and Rebecca Horn, who's using her face with pencils to draw. How do we communicate um, like Anthony Hall with other species, like electrogenic fish, as the Romans did, or um, become a cyborg like Steve Mann in all the ways that it advanced so much that he no longer looks like a cyborg. And he had a, somebody in um, a McDonald's in Paris tried to rip off his thing. It was, it was a terrible thing. How, how do we um, change the way that we compute or how our contact lenses work to enable us to be more cyborgian? And on the bottom right, one of my favorites, Michael Burton, how do we let other species give us their good bacteria so that as these pandemics occur, we can draw birds to us to give us foreign bacteria and strengthen our system. So don't believe everything you think is, is about the world we're in now, where some people will tell you the world is flat. Google will tell you the world is rippled. My airplane tells me that there were airplanes coexisting in this weird cup with um, windmills and then teach me how to survive by showing me on a Delft tile. Like, the current world messes with your perception. Any events for an evacuation, escape that lighting will appear. Follow the lights. Travel, the airplane is disappearing. So don't believe there is no airplane, but also do believe that you can have eyes on the top of your head. Do your research and realize in the sensory homunculus that your tongue and lips and hand are the most sensitive. That means the middle of your body is barely sensory. Watch who you date and whether you're actually dating them because of their genes without knowing it. This is the sweaty t-shirt test. These women choose their, the t-shirt they like. Um, skipping that for a minute, it turns out that women choose somebody who has the opposite gene from them, a particular MCH gene, and this project, um, Little Nudity, is a date by James Auger. Well, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna choose our mate through smell unconsciously, why don't we smell them without seeing them? So it's a blind date. Other unreliable things, our senses read Margaret Thatcher like this, but really that right image is monstrous. It's just that when things are upside down, we can't really perceive them. So our senses are completely flawed. Here's the rubber hand test I talked about. We can make senses feeling in things that are not our own. And this wonderful test about the, how the corpus callosum works and how the left brain lords over the right is, I'm not gonna take time to show it to you, but essentially this proves that the less left brain dominates because a per person with a split corpus callosum will make up a story with these two images and the cards he or she chooses or they choose by making what the left brain sees, the chicken leg, dominant. Um, People study the census by doing awful things to people. This is Darwin and Duchenne de Boulogne taking people from institutions and electrocuting them. Uh, a trigger alert there on that image. Uh-oh, did I lose you? Um, hold on a second. I might have to screen share again or stop my screen share. So I'm momentarily popping out and sharing my screen again. Sorry, you can't ask me questions in the interim. Um, there was some issue of privacy, but I'm and just double click here. My computer's, my mouse is sort of invisible. There we go. Hang on. Sorry about showing you my, my world, but I don't mind. Do you mind? Um, now the question is when you're lecturing, can you even find your work again? There it is, Sculpture X, here we go, thank you. So this is uh, them testing one of these people from an institution on if you electrocute the face, what does it feel like? And this is Daito Manabe electrocuting his friend. San, me, it's. So eventually, 
after a whole lot, it gets stronger and stronger. I love that moment when they actually DJ people's faces and they all have the same emotion and then suddenly they're back to themselves. This is scary stuff, but it's really important that we understand we can be DJed. So coming up to that kind of work in a moment, these are all kinds of ways we become cyborgs, self X. And the funny thing is, I was on my way to Erie to visit Lisa's class uh, in an airplane, and my airplane hit a bus when it was on the runway landing at a high speed. And they were really worried that there was some terrible damage. Nobody knew what had happened, and that's what happened. And that led me to think about this book. I walked through the airport in um, Detroit asking pilots, do they feel the width of their wings? And only this third pilot, who was like 65, felt the width of his wings. So I did this drawing of what it would be like to feel the width of your wings, thought about people who have that kind of wing and connecting to space through um, little drawings of mine or thinking about Michael Burton again, connecting, extending his beard or Hans Longseth and his long beard in the Smithsonian Institution now and the proud owners of this beard, these scientists and curators. Um, so I started to try to extend my own body, but the robotics people wouldn't have anything of it. So my students and I made these like animations of your hair being robotic. And this was the origin of the book, extending the human head. So whether it's 19th century hair rolls, and usually I ask a question here, but I can't ask you. So on the bottom is a lice catcher. It's like a little house for lice. Well, if you're going to get your hair done and wear it three days, then you're going to need that. But these are parodies like you can have a battle in your hair. In this book, we explore the history of marks on the face and how they are used to measure and read. Um, how, how people in crime believed at one time that your, your nose and ear measurements could help obtain a criminal. And so they came up with all of these charts. This is Bertillon. But we found out that it, if they were identical twins, it wouldn't work. So Bertillon invented then the um, headshot and then ultimately the fingerprint. And we have ways of reading the head. The human head can be read through phrenology where people like in the 19th century believed that you, you could tell a personality by the bumps on their head. And as we went into the 20th, we could use machines. But then it was debunked. And eventually we started to move into the Oculus Rift with an early version where video is different for your eyes. This man, Alphonse Schilling, is changing how you see near is far up is down left is right and that's how he does it with lenses in the book you'll see people feeding us through michael burton michiko nika feeding us algae through wearable suits or these projects that show how science can go wrong that's the onco mouse by tanya blanco or the students looking at what does it look to have esp and then I look at lots of images from fashion and start to think about like heads with fungi or heads coming off or these robots in space or sensation machines. These are early sensation images. One is a sensorama. You go into that machine like that fellow and you feel wind and air and sound and sight. So I'm thinking about the head expanding and being controlled by others. This is a good representation. I'm almost done. I'm going to show you just a tiny last bit. Eventually, the human in the building meeting or the brain squashing and you becoming a little bit of human and a little bit of flesh, Lorenzo Oggiano, or your head like Khan and Seleznik being sent to Mars and nobody, like you're, you're going to uh, rebirth the population through your head. I'm finally going to share a little poetry project. Through the years, I have asked strangers for poems on the train. This is some press I've received and a poem, my favorite, squish cacao is a word no one knows, not even I. I'm guessing it's a sharp rock that never ends, squish cacao. That's by Ava, she was seven years old, one of the first poems by strangers. This is PBS. Um, 
I'm doing a project called 365 Day Subway Poems by New Yorkers. You could write about your life, anything. That's because on every single trip to and from work but since last that spring. I want to leave time for questions. So I'm just going to end on this poem by uh, Chappelle Mallard, a fellow who is a brilliant writer, but also a trainer. I met him in Brooklyn. He wrote a poem and then wrote a second poem one day when we traveled together. This is just before Trump's election and well before um, the incredible changes that have happened in the world, but it was incredibly poignant. I hope you're hearing audio. I have no idea, but let's just listen for a minute and then we'll end. The weight of simple questions or the dark star gravity of tiny hands is enough to choke on and beat back the burn in your own eyes. To be black is to consider the untimely death of your children. There is no language for why a life matters. Its logic is warmth, the way one hand can curl and leaf blindly around another. A brown finger stuck in a bramble of hair, eyes, laughter squeezing the ribs, hurt so thick, it makes the day slow and heavy and wordless. What does it cost me to explain my life to you? To find acquittal for my breathing? To plead for water? To question the nature of my love and pain and hope to better answer your own? What should it cost when we pay in children? in years. Simple questions, tiny hands, enough to choke on and beat back the burn in your eyes and sometimes find yourself silent and shaking. Amazing. Um, boy, that was a lot of slides. See, that's our shared window now. You're all exhausted. You probably can't even have questions. Thank you, Sculpture X, Lisa Austin, James, thank you so much. I spelled your name wrong. Oops, sorry, but it's almost right. Um, if you want to follow or do anything, there's a what I call Bookface and Instagram. Pretty much you can see most of this stuff on Instagram. And you can buy my books, that would be nice, but no, no pressure, I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Madeline. That was a you know, fan, yeah, fantastic talk. Um, now, hey, we do, have, we do have like 10 minutes left, so if you do have a question for Madeline, type it in. Uh, we'll try to get to as many, you know, it's not the best system, but it's, you know, the, it's the best system for this system. Um, so if you do have a question, please do feel free to type those in. Um, I'll, I can start. I have a question. Yeah, maybe, you know, get things going. So one of the things um, that I like about all of this work is there's almost this element, I was thinking sort of this idea of almost like Frankenstein in a way. It's like, okay, we have this, you know, should we use this? What are the consequences of us going in, you know, either when we invent, you know, these things like robotics, you know, thinking about like, you know, like what happens with consciousness. I think, you know, the way you talk about landscape, about how we, you know, are going into this, it, there's, it's only, you know, capital, you know, is what we're looking for. It's not, it's convenience and capital, right? Um, and resources. Um, what do you think, you know, like art in artists, you know, uh, can do to maybe, you know, uh, talk about these things, you know, in terms of like, especially like young artists, what, what advice would you give to young artists to talk about our current moment? My main idea goes to everybody, which is, I can't bear, it's, it's so easy to see like the burning Amazon. It's so, it's so upsetting. You feel miserable and then you close the computer. It's, you can give money, you can vote, but on a smaller scale, I, my thought is that you can engage these things in the way that I said, by coming close to them, by, by like, even if you're stuck indoors in lockdown and there's like a home plant, it's just to, just to look at these things. It's just like to shift the hierarchy a little tiny bit. That's, that's all I hope for in students and anybody. Um, People feel that when I do workshops, if, if like, or when I did those studios where I made students, instead of bringing cardboard into the studio, they brought vegetables to carve. And boy, they started to rot and the studio smelled so cool. It was like, why does the studio not smell? Why does it smell like paint? That's what I would say is, is and that doesn't have to be your main pro practice. Like I didn't show you, I showed you the resin project, but it's like kind of hypocritical me casting tons of resin, resin, which is like nasty plastic <laughs> oil base. Yeah. So as a, a side thing, it's like going to the real nature. And the idea of that project was there would be no nature. You'd have to preserve it by casting it. It's, it's dark 
and hopeful. Okay. I don't know if I answered you enough. I, I think everybody should figure out a tiny little practice of shifting the balance, um, even if it's a house plant. Like my, my daughters name the house plants, and that always feels really interesting. Suddenly, when Daisy dies, it's like a tragedy because it's Daisy. Now we have Daisy seeds, and they're like, maybe that's a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do, we had a couple of questions come in, uh, Manla, I'm going to try to get to them. So from Morgan, um, in regards to the electrical shock experiments, have you looked at all into the direct application reading of electric signals from the brain? I'm an art history student at Edinburgh, but someone I was uh, with who had a brain tumor temporarily had a machine placed in his skull that would me measure seizure activity and location. Uh, I was in Bethesda, Maryland. And a lot of these have real scientific applications. So I, 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 I'm totally with you on that. And yeah, that guy, Daito Manabe, was trying to do um, various brain stuff. And of course, there's a whole proliferation of sensors that technologists say will be in the next 10, 20, 30 years. So I do look into that. Um, I don't have the technology to do it. I read it and I read, read as much as I can about it. And I I stay both afraid and optimistic about it. So that's how I like to be. Like, I don't want to close off these things, but I try not to write about things that are, I, I bring up science into my books, but they're more like design objects that have science. So if there's a body of science that I can't apply, I won't research it as much, but I, I'm fascinated. That part I really am researching, like sensors. It'll be hard to write a book about sensors, won't it? Because have you noticed that I like the way things look? I like really nice artifacts. So, yeah. I, I hope, a, you, hope your friend um, is doing well, by the way. Absolutely, yes. Um, I've, another one that came in uh, from Rachel. You briefly mentioned that you were looking at human-animal hybridity. I'm interested in where you're going with this. So, I wonder if that's one of my students, Rachel. Um, well, if it is, hello. Where I'm going with that is some place really fun. I'm really researching that kind of thing. How, like, some of, I have, draw lines, like there's an artist that injects pig blood into herself, and I, I'm, I'm not yet that fascinated with that. But then there's an, a many applications, like there's a book that uses the material from fireflies so that the book glows like that really interests me I mean if it's terrible demise I think that fireflies are endangered so I would not go further with something which is endangering but if the enzymes from fireflies can light up books that's really cool so that's where I'm going with it it's um, I'm also looking at machines and humans humans and animals animals and machines that kind of thing um, where am I going with it? I'm going to the future, I think. I'm, I'm going, to, actually, where am I really going with it? A lot of my books are things I like. I don't know if you notice that too, right? Like I can justify what I'm doing because I like it. I like combinations. So that's where I'm going, both a belief that that's where things are heading because I see it in all the biomimicry and all the little robots that imitate creatures. And so... Um, I'm looking across disciplines at that. Fantastic. And, and I think that that is, um, you know, kind of what I said in the introduction, that is such a pertinent thing because I think that, you know, art can become sort of this, you know, I think that this dialogue can be, you know, broader and what you're doing where you're, you know, you are doing your research, you're, you know, thinking about those things. I think that, you know, we have sort of created, you know, compartmentalized and pushed nature of the science sort of like, you know, brought us up to, you know, oh, we're here, everything's there. I think, you know, re-examining that in a very critical way, you know, to where it's like, okay, we need to rethink this. We need to rethink our relationship with, you know, um, you know, in a very existential way about, especially with our climate and nature, it's, you know, and I think what you're doing is, you know, sort of, you know, moving that way. And I, it, it's just fascinating to see visual art, you know, enter that dialogue. By the way, I'm not alone. Like there's a famous physicist. And if you look him up, one of the great, great famous physicists said that when we move into space, we'll have to transform. I read this years ago before I was interested in this, that we would have scales like lizards. So um, when I put pine cones on me, I'm not messing around. I don't think like, 
I'm not like an Instagram person that puts it on because it's ornamental. I'm really thinking like, okay, if I smile and I have those tiles, what does it do? How do I move now? How does it constrict me? It may look ornamental, like, but. No, I think, and that's like, yeah, it, it may on the surface, it's that, or, that maybe that ornamentation, but there's something much more into it where it's, you know, and that's sort of the arresting thing as a viewer. It's like, oh, you know, you might be drawn in, but then it compels you to really start thinking, you know, you know, kind of about some very heavy things, I think, in a way, you know? And yeah, I think we are almost out of time, but I think it is fantastic work. And I, Madeline, I want to thank you um, for speaking here at Sculpture X. Um, I hope, and I want to thank everybody for, you know, attending as well. Um, I want to uh, remind everybody that at six o'clock, uh, there is another presentation about teaching art online, uh, which is something I think that we all are getting used to. And it is convenient by um, you know, from the Sculpture Center in Cleveland, and it features uh, Kyle Dancevitz um, from the Sculpture Center in Queens, Basir Khan and Kenneth Tam talking about how we teach, um, you know, how we, solutions, strategies for teaching art online. I want to thank Madeline one more time. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank uh, you, everybody, and hello out there. Um, hope to meet you one day when this is, this bloody thing gets passed. <laughs> Take care and be well, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having me, James. Thank you. Thank you.